on Imperfect Paradise, why we villainize coyotes. They are smart and cunning. They are bold and fearless. And what we actually know about coyotes may surprise you. Listen to Imperfect Paradise wherever you listen to podcasts. LAist and Show and Tell present an evening with David Sedaris. The writer, humorist, and radio contributor will take the stage Saturday, November 16th at the United Theater on Broadway. Tickets and information at laist.com slash events. Today on the LA Report, in Orange County, officials are demanding a Huntington Beach nonprofit refund more than $2 million of taxpayer money. LAS reporter Nick Gerda broke the story. It's important to note that Supervisor Doe directed most of this money outside of the public's view, uh, and the timing of this money overlaps with when his then 20 year old daughter, Rhiannon Doe, listed herself as the nonprofit's executive director. California sea lions have started to fall ill, and domoic acid may be to blame once again. And later, we go to the San Fernando Valley to celebrate the Japanese festival Obon. It's Saturday, August 3rd. I'm Jill Replogle. That's coming up on the weekend edition of the L.A. Report from L.A.ist 89.3. But first, here's the latest news. Viet America Society, a Huntington Beach nonprofit given over $2 million meant to feed seniors in need by OC Supervisor Andrew Doe, is being told to refund that money. The county says it failed to account for what happened to the taxpayer funds. Senior reporter Nick Gerda looked into the demand. The county wrote that the nonprofit has 30 days to submit the payment. I'll just say this is all highly unusual. The other meal contractors for this program have been cooperative with the county's document requests, and that's according to public records we obtained. According to public records, the group in question was headed on and off by Supervisor Doe's daughter, Rhiannon Doe. Here's Nick Gerda again. Supervisor Doe directed most of this money outside of the public's view, and the timing of this money overlaps with when his daughter, Rhiannon Doe, listed herself as the nonprofit's executive director. The Doe's and current leaders of the nonprofit have not responded to requests from LAist for comment. People are responsible for 95 percent of wildfires in California. Julie Cart with CalMatters looked at the many ways humans have started destructive fires, including while doing yard work. If you mow your lawn in the middle of the day or at the high heat time, uh, you're kicking up rocks that can spark against the metal undercarriage of the lawnmower. That's actually how the French fire was started in Mariposa County on July 4th last month. Hart says people should mow their lawns in the early or late afternoon hours. And if you're planning on driving, especially to any campgrounds, Cart has some more tips. Not drive your car with its really, really hot tailpipe and park on the side of a road where there's grasses. Be careful. Really be certain that you put out a campfire or even a backyard fire pit. We have a full list of tips on how to prevent fires on our website, laist.com. COVID-19 cases are spiking right now, and it looks like it will be sticking around for a while. Dr. Peter Chin Hong is an infectious disease specialist, and he has some advice if you're weighing the risks. The main question to ask right now in 2024 is, are you older than 65 or very immune compromised, or do you live with one of these uh, vulnerable groups? Uh, Because if you're older or immune compromised, uh, you should go ahead and get a vaccine. Chin Hong says if you do get COVID, remember that you can get the antiviral therapy Paxlovid. And of course, stay home if you have COVID symptoms. California sea lions have started showing up sick and stranded in Los Angeles County again this summer. McKenna Sievertson says wildlife rescuers believe domoic acid poisoning is to blame. A facility serving Ventura and Santa Barbara counties has been inundated with more than 100 rescue reports each day since late last month. Sick animals were recently seen in Malibu, and the Marine Mammal Care Center rescued its first patient from Marina Del Rey Thursday, who died shortly after. John Warner is CEO of the San Pedro Center. Every year we're seeing things that catch us as surprises. Warner says these domoic acid events that have been unusual in the past have become more common, and they've been working to prepare for what could come this season. I'm McKenna Sievertson. If you come across a sick sea lion in L.A., you can call the Marine Mammals Care Center for help. And they're always looking for more volunteers or donations. A group of Northeast L.A. residents are working to make sure their extra homegrown food doesn't go to waste. Ava Lalonde has more. 
The Hillside Produce Cooperative meets once a month for about 20 minutes to swap fresh produce like fruits and vegetables along with goods like nut butter and honey. The co-op was founded during the Great Recession in 2008 and membership increased during the pandemic when people were home more and grocery stores had less in stock. Now, over 700 people are on the co-op's contact list from different areas of Los Angeles, with about 25 people coming every month. For LAist, I'm Ava Lalonde. Find out how you can participate at LAist.com. And if you love water birds, we've got an event for you. International Bird Rescue Center in San Pedro will have an open house today. The organization cares for sick and injured goals and pelicans. And it's been a busy year after a health crisis that affected over 400 pelicans, many of which are still recovering. Here's spokesperson Ariana Gastelum. They are still in recovery. Those are the birds that you'll still be seeing here in the aviary or from this pelican crisis. The facility is typically not open to the public to protect the animals, but you can get close to the aviary today and even see how they use dish soap to clean birds. Here's Gastelum again. We won't be using oil, of course, but we'll likely be using something more like chocolate syrup or mustard or something like that. But you get the same end result. You can visit them from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. today. And if you can't make it but still want to visit, they're also accepting volunteers. More after this break. Add a little curiosity into your routine with TED Talks Daily, the podcast that brings you a new TED Talk every weekday. In less than 15 minutes a day, you'll go beyond the headlines and learn about the big ideas shaping your future. Coming up, how AI will change the way we communicate, how to be a better leader, and more. Listen to TED Talks Daily wherever you get your podcasts. L.A. has done show and tell, present An Evening with David Sedaris. The humorist, comedian, author, and radio contributor will take the stage at the United Theater on Broadway to share insights, read from both published and unpublished work, and host a live Q&A with the audience, followed by a book signing. It's Saturday, November 16th at the United Theater. Tickets and information at las.com slash events. Welcome back to the L.A. Report. I'm Jill Replogle. Every summer, Japanese Americans gather to celebrate Obon, a joyous festival dedicated to remembering and honoring ancestors. Producer Stephanie Ratoper takes us on a tour of one of these festivals in the San Fernando Valley. Walking into the San Fernando Valley Obon Festival, the first thing that hits me is the smell of teriyaki beef on the grill. There's home-cooked food everywhere. Chirashi, Okinawan dango, udon, cold somen noodles. Hashi, a fork. Obon literally means festival of joy, and it's a chance for us to celebrate, be with friends, family to remember your ancestors and thank them for the life you have now. Growing up Japanese American, Obon brings up instant nostalgia. It reminds me of being a kid eating peanut butter mochi and shave ice after dancing. There's games being played, fishing derby and dough ball. People wear traditional clothing like yukata and hapi coats and greet each other like old friends. You hear a lot of joyful laughter. That's just friendship, appreciation, and joy. During World War II, when Japanese Americans were incarcerated in camps, one of the things that they insisted on is that they be able to celebrate Obon in camp. There's something really powerful to me that despite all the circumstances that they still they still celebrated. Hey. 
The most important thing about Obon is everybody comes together and dances in the circle. It's hard to explain the feeling of dancing in unison with a large group of joyful strangers. Each dance tells a story in a handful of simple movements. Fishermen casting nets into the sea, coal miners pushing carts. It's like honoring something ancient and bringing it into the present. I did lose my mom a couple of years ago, so Obon became even more special for me to remember her and to celebrate with joy. For many Japanese Americans of my generation, Obon festivals are a way to pass on tradition and culture. My daughter is seven. So tell me, what are you most excited about doing at Obon today? I'm excited for the dancing, mostly. The sun sets as the dancing continues. I jump into the circle and dance too. You just heard from Lene McKeever, Reverend Yukari Tori, Jason Fenton, Tracy Ishigo, Emily Anderson, and Eiko Garcia. I'm Stephanie Ritopper. Thanks for listening to the weekend edition of the LA Report. The weekend LA Report is hosted by me, Jill Replogle, and produced by Kevin Tidmarsh. Our engineer is Sean Corey Campbell. The podcast is edited by Fiona Ng. Catherine Mailhouse is the Director of Content Development. And our Vice President of Podcasts is Shana Naomi Crockmall. Join us back here tomorrow. You can read more at laist.com and listen live on the LAist app or on the radio at 89.3 FM. Listeners like you help make the LA Report possible. Please donate at laist.com slash join. This podcast is supported by Gordon and Donna Crawford, who believe quality journalism makes Southern California a better place to live. On Imperfect Paradise, why do we villainize coyotes? They are smart and cunning. In my block alone, we've had five pets killed. What do we know about coyotes? And what happens when a town tries to take care of its, quote, coyote problem? We would just be controlling the intense population. Killing coyotes to manage the population has never worked. Listen to Imperfect Paradise wherever you listen to podcasts.